Now in Romans, the sixth chapter this morning. I was on the phone last evening. My wife said it was one call was an hour and 45 minutes. And it was with a pastor of long standing pertaining to his personal ministry. It is shocking and amazing. This person went to a certain Bible college. He served God as a pastor. And he has all kinds of resentments against Christians in general. And he doesn't, uh, he's very gifted, very bright, but he does not appropriate anything that he learned all of those years in seminary. Now, it is simply amazing how few people are ever going to make it. I am totally convinced. I had to pray last night because I had three of them yesterday, mostly outside of this ministry. But people sit in the classroom just like you do. And for some reason, they never... Oh, they're going to go to heaven. They're going to go to heaven. But when God says many are called, and very few are ever chosen. He doesn't mean as far as heaven goes. But he means as far as advancing into the maturity of a greater grace life. The soul quirks that people have are absolutely unbelievable. The subjective experience that continually goes on, the observation by sight, the trends that lead to spiritual neurosis, which partially hinders and limits the soul from ever functioning with divine viewpoint, the inability to measure the dynamics of divine statements, the inability to measure the denied dynamics of a divine statement as given by the Holy Spirit, the carnality in listening to messages, missing the whole point that every message is do or die for you and do or die for me. Uh, in terms of growing, in terms of advancing, in terms of knowing, in terms of specific understanding. Well, this person went on to tell me of how he felt about Christianity. And I came to the conclusion that many of his problems were rebellion. He didn't want to obey the table of organization. It had nothing to do with me, by the way. His relationship with me is very, very close had to do with watching a pastor's wife and getting upset, not knowing her condition, evaluating somebody all the time, feeling he was put down by pastors. And while you would expect him to excel beyond the measurement of, of human conduct, but he just doesn't. Well, you I, all of us, must get down to business and become real people. And these soul quirks that we have are unbelievable. You'll never be able to measure them. God will have to search them out and reveal them to us. The changes in personalities that take place the, how self-consciousness enters into self-pity. And without this person being able to receive that, uh, the self-consciousness of his soul is filled with self-pity. And self-pity always results in self-destruction. And what happens is the conscience is filled with guilt 
and the spirit of the soul is wounded. And the emotions base much of their feelings on their reaction to the past. And the mind is filled with jealousy and the volition is filled with rationalization. And these souls are in obviously retrogression. They, at some point they started to digress and they go years and years in retrogression. And some of them preach doctrine. It's amazing. And eventually they enter into what I would term studying the secular side of it, spiritual neurosis. Now, spiritual neurosis is when a person is partially infected, but still has some ability to think. Psychosis is when the emotional patterns have been completely been destroyed, and their thinking processes are neutralized, and they are not able to respond, and they have quenched and grieved the Holy Spirit but they don't even understand what they've done. So the soul quirks that go on in people's lives are unbelievable. Then usually either they get into legalism or lasciviousness. And they'll go out and commit adultery. Or they'll do some sublimation on fornication and the use of alcohol and then they start that trend in their life and it's a quite a trend and then it causes an infection and the soul becomes infected and then this infection begins to build up layers of infection and before they know it their attitude toward life is completely paralyzed um, I don't in any way want this to be negative, but I'm telling you this, and I'm not going to hold it back ever again. Only a few people in the universe are ever going to make maturity. Millions will go to heaven. I watch people through these 38 years, and they just they last for six years, 10 years, 12 years. And then they get discouraged, and then they faint. And it's most, it's, and it's thousands of people that you'd never even think. Do you know the 7,000 Baptist pastors in 1988 in Kentucky that are out of work? Nervous breakdowns? Do you know that the 16,000 Assembly of God preachers in the last uh, three years that have quit? So you put Kentucky with the 16,000 Assembly of God, and we're not indicting those two denominations, but there's 26,000 pastors that said we can't handle it. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way. What does it take to get your feelings hurt? How paranoid are you? Now be honest with me. How paranoid are you? Now, I'll guarantee you not one of us in this room can be objective unless we're spiritual. I'll guarantee you you think somebody's acting weird, somebody's neglecting you, somebody doesn't care. We are the most weird group of people in the human race. I, I don't mean us. I mean the human race. We're a part of it, so include me. But it's the most outstanding. You know, somebody will say, oh, those two weeks of classes have saved my life. You'll never know. You'll never know. In the next uh, seven out of 12 classes, they don't get up in the morning. <laughs> but those two weeks saved their life. I'm always a little skeptical of these, this statement. Sunday's message saved my life. Three weeks later, Sunday's message saved my life. I hope your life was saved before the message came. <laughs> I hope the message complimented you, but for crying out loud. What's going to get you down for the next one? Well, there's obviously something drastically wrong. And uh, it's, it's obviously one thing. 
failure to know followed by failure to experience followed by failure to appropriate. I must know something. I must experience something by faith. I must know something by grace. I must experience something by faith rest. So these problems that show you, now let me, show, let me give you a little indication how you can check yourself to see if you're in an emotional problem. One, do you have any self-pity at all? If you do, you're into retrogression. That means you're into a deceptive trend of emotional problems with God. Two, do you get jealous? Do you envy and are you insecure with your peers? Are you insecure of your finances? Or is God on the throne? If you do, you're in ret concern is legitimate. Insecurity is retrogression, if it's consistent. Do you rationalize instead of pray? Do you try to manipulate instead of trusting God with all your heart in your volition? In your volition. Do I have consciousness of any guilt that I cover up? Do I cover up a guilt complex in my conscience? Is my old sin nature in an attitude and trend toward a lust pattern? Is it motivated by lasciviousness and sublimation, such as promiscuity or drinking? Or do I practice legalism, running other people down because of my self-righteousness? What's the condition of my old sin nature? Do I have what it takes to live up to my call without wavering when things happen? Do I have the character and the intestinal fortitude to stand still in my call and never to even consider an alternative to my call. I've said to God, you take me home, but I'm not considering an alternative to my call. And there is no series of circumstances that could make me consider an alternative to my call. This is an age for stability. 1 Peter 5.12 Maturity, James 4.6 Steadfastness in 1 Corinthians 15.57 Divine Viewpoint, Isaiah 26.3. The Eternal Purpose of Ephesians 3.11. Now, this infection comes into the perceptive realm and it begins to cause negative volition toward the Word of God. The minute infection's in you, you start to get negative. You could sit into a, to a ministry that is doing everything it's supposed to do, preach the gospel, teach the word of God, go soul winning, uh, send missionaries out, reach the world. And you could sit right in that ministry and say, I don't know what it is. It probably me. I'm just not getting anything out of it. But it's probably me, you arrogant, proud, egocentric monster. Of course it's you. Who do you think you are? Well, you feel that way because somewhere along the line, your soul has an infection. Just like you have an infection, causes a fever, this is causing a spiritual reaction. It's an infection. And somewhere along the line, you went negative toward a doctrine. You went negative toward grace. You went negative toward love, and you've got an infection. And finally, that infection smothers your capacity and it makes you live in the inability of receptivity. So as you try to perceive truth to a Bible doctrine, there is a definite emptiness that's in your soul. And this emptiness is an area that has not been filled up by God. 
and you are preoccupied with people, you're preoccupied with your circumstances, and you're preoccupied with yourself. And uh, those three pr principles of preoccupation are going to bring you into spiritual neurosis or partial paralyzation in your relationship toward God, and eventually psychosis, which means you make a final decision to go against your call, probably to go against your local church, and possibly your pastor teacher after that. And uh, all your husband, all your wife, depending on how you look at it and what you're like with your weaknesses. So we have to make sure that every day we're renewed in our mind and that we begin to realize retroactive truth. Now, retropositional truth is what we are going to study this morning. When Paul speaks in Romans 5, and I bring in things here just so occasionally when I quote, I have a reasonably good memory, but I, I can quote and give people the absolute credit for saying something rather than ad libit. Now, Paul answers many charges. The moral man said in Romans 1, he said, I'm not like the immoral man, and he does 19 things all the time. And Paul says in Romans 2, 1 and 2, you're not one iota better than the immoral man. And the moral man didn't believe that. The religious man came along in Romans 2. This is something we've had. And Paul is answering an argument all the time. The religious man said, you're absolutely right. His morality will never get him to heaven. And he's saying about the moral man that his, reality, his morality will never get him to heaven. All the time he's trying to get to heaven by self-righteousness. What a mixed up universe. Then the Jews come along and they say, Abraham is our father. We are not going along with this whole stuff that you're telling us, justification by grace through faith. Uh, Abraham is our father. And Paul said, sure, Abraham was justified by faith. How do you like that? Then the next crowd said, our argument is this. If you're justified by faith at the point of salvation, where does this end up when you face God? And Paul said, in perfect acceptance. He's always answering an argument. All the time, he's answering arguments. Now Romans 6. There are three things that we have to understand about Romans 6. We must understand the doctrine of baptism. So I think that I will thoroughly give you the doctrine of baptism. After giving you the doctrine of baptism, I'll explain the doctrine of identification, then the doctrine of reckoning, then the doctrine of yielding, and then the doctrine of obeying. So we have some very, very vital doctrines that must be academically understood and faithfully experienced. Now, first of all, we'll have the term baptism. Now, the verb baptize and the noun baptism. We have the verb baptize. Then we have the noun baptism. Our Greek words that are not translated but are transliterated. That's the first thing I want you to understand about the noun and the verb. They are not translated, but they are transliterated. The etymology of baptizo, B-A-P-T-I-D-Z-O. You would pronounce it, of course, B-A-P, then T-E-E-D, and then Z-O, baptizo. Baptizo, we know the etymology because of the use of the word in the ancient Grecian literature. So, if you listen, we want to get into a thorough, comprehensive understanding. You're to understand this doctrine beyond the church member's Sunday morning, beyond the church member's Sunday night. You are to be specialists on every doctrine. You're to know every doctrine inside, outside, around. You're to hear it. You're to write it down. You're to reflect it. You're to meditate upon it. Then you're to re review it. And then you're to review it again until it becomes you. Now, the swords dipped in blood, and this is an interesting thing, 
identified the sword with warfare. The swords dipped in blood identified the swords in warfare. The swords was, the sword rather, was baptized, identified with the blood by immersing it in the blood. The sword came out bloody. Now this is what we receive in ancient Grecian history pertaining to this word. We've gone way back into it to, so that it, it isn't given as the same old thing, although we have to stay true to the premise. So I hope you can understand me. You take the sword, you dip it in blood, it comes out bloody, and there it is, identification in warfare. The metal identified with water when tempering it, baptizing the metal. So you took, put the metal, put it in water, and of course there was an identification. The sinking of a ship, the ship, when it would sink, was identified with the water. Now, baptism then means to identify with, to make one with, to make one with, to make one with. Something so identified with something else that its nature or character is changed. But the baptism does not save. I gave you that in our last class. The medieval times, baptismal regeneration denies grace, denies the finished work. It is apostasy and doctrines of demons. Church of Christ have it. Others have it. Never, never give place to it. There, the water baptism symbolizes the change that has already taken place by believing in Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit placed us in his death, buried us, and we shared in the likeness of his resurrection, it already took place at the point of salvation. Five things happened at the point of salvation. And the most uh, vital one for us this morning is the baptism not of the Holy Spirit but by the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about the baptism by the Holy Spirit in which in, in he baptizes the believer into the body of Jesus Christ into a union with him in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. Now, the actual identification takes place in God's eyes. Then there is a ritual identification. In the ritual identification, you have representative identification. The ritual is the representative identification. And I hope that that is clear to you. The individual is really identified with the water, but the water is symbolic of something else. This is representative identification. There are seven baptisms in the Bible. Seven. Four are real and three are ritual. Keep that in mind. The baptism of the believer in the church age is the ritual picture of the real baptism of the spirit. Ritual baptism must follow salvation. Never proceed it such as with children. Now, the believer needs doctrine of the finished work before he's baptized. He needs to understand positional truth, A. Retroactive positional truth, B. He needs to understand the current reckoning process of truth, C. He needs to realize experiential positional truth, D. And he must stand the difference between eternal viewpoint and natural viewpoint and divine good and self-righteousness. These are things that precede anybody's baptism. And if we're going to teach people about baptism before they get baptized, these alone are the areas that we must teach them. Now, as we study out the truth and other types of doctrinal application pertaining to the subject of baptism, as we teach it, we must understand difference 
between relationship and fellowship. Relationship takes place the moment of salvation. Fellowship takes place the moment of understanding finished work doctrine. Everybody enters into a relationship by the baptism of the Spirit and body of Christ when they are saved and believe in Jesus. But they enter into fellowship of his sharing his death, sharing his burial, sharing his resurrection, until they have grace understanding, categories, and some understanding of faith rest. The believer was baptized in the early church very soon after he was saved. Why? Because as soon as the individual was saved, now I want to quote from history, be careful not to misquote it, Paul or any other believer like Philip who was tithed immediately gave them a long lesson in the word of God or Bible categorical doctrine. This might have been six or seven hours assumed by church historians after the salvation. They'd spend six or seven hours instructing the person on these principles of baptism, and then he was baptized most of the time within 24 hours after his salvation. Immediately upon understanding the truth, he was baptized. No delay, he was baptized. Now, first of all, I hope that every person in this ministry has been baptized after they were saved by immersion. It is commanded in Matthew 28, 18. It was practiced by all believers. It was an act of obedience that the Lord commanded. It was a public declaration of faith to be saved to an unsaved community, plus a tremendous demonstration of identification in the angelic conflict, the elect and fallen angels. And that's very crucial to understand. Now, the word baptize is 115 uses in the, new, in the Word of God. 115 uses, basically, in the New Testament. Now, as we consider the, de definite, uh, the definition of baptism, we must remember no one should be baptized until he understands it. Now, uh, occasionally in our lifetime, we have made some mistakes. And I regret those mistakes, such as having children get into baptismal in the past, uh, here and there, and laughing. That will never happen again as long as I'm pat. Uh, it's uh, That child should no more in the baptismal tank going through a ritual and a ceremony like some people do. It was, it's a disgrace and it was an indictment against our mystery. But it will never, ever happen again. And I was extremely humiliated and embarrassed a few isolated times as, and get in there and say the water's cold and everyone starts laughing. That is extremely disrespectful to God. And no one in such a case should ever, ever even be baptized, and I wouldn't even count it. Don't get in the baptismal and say the water's cold, or start laughing. Baptismal is the most serious. It doesn't save us. It doesn't save us. We're already saved. We've already experienced the real baptism by the Spirit into the union of the body of Christ. But baptism is extremely Important people in the early church were killed because of outward baptisms and what it meant, their declaration of lining up with the Bible. They were destroyed and killed secretly, and some of them never reached their homes. Well, believers have a real identification with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Retroactive positional truth, current positional truth. Well, that's exactly what the spiritual application of baptism is all about. Retroactive identification with his death. Number two, the burial takes place to make sure the death is final. Do you know that many people don't experience the finality of 
of their death with Christ. They never have a burial. He did this to me last year. She did this to me a month ago. I was hurt when I was in that place. And I was hurt. That means that that person hasn't the least understanding of baptism. Baptism to them is a sham. Baptism means they die. It's an historical fact. They were buried. It's an historical reality. And uh, their burial reveals the results of their death. There is no more thing to remember about their body. They're dead. And they're sharing in current positional truth, experiential positional truth, by reckoning that they're dead and alive unto God, and we'll get into that later. Water baptism, then, is a ritual baptism. But the water being symbolic of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and the person being identified with the water, therefore with the work and person of Jesus Christ. The person going into the water is identified with the water, and he is saying, and I quote, in effect, I am identified with him in his death and in his burial, and therefore I reject self-righteousness. I reject being good in the flesh. I reject relevant righteousness. I reject all good religious trends in my life. I am guilty. I am crucified. I am buried. I am going to show you not only my death, but my burial. No more counseling about the past, unless it can momentarily help somebody who's ignorant. And then it's okay. Burial, burial, burial. I don't care what you think or feel. Your feelings have no more dominion over divine facts. Feelings have no more dominion over facts. Facts lead the way. Feelings are irrelevant. Always irrelevant. Thank God if they're good ones. All right. This is a victory over the tree of knowledge. It's a victory over governmental evil. It's a victory over self-righteousness, crucifixion, burial, the ritual explaining what happened at the point of salvation, at the point of doctrine coming into the heart. Now, the person coming out of the water is identified with the air. He's identified with the air, which represents identification with Christ in his resurrection. He comes out of the water. He comes into the air. What does it mean? Identification with Christ in his resurrection. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and it's finished. Sin's gone. Sin paid for, death executed, burial complete, resurrection, miracle, ascension, another miracle, seated with Christ, faith rest, power and prayer. Okay, the believer gives the testimony to current positional truth, allowing his resurrection life to flow through him, and he now takes on divine character spiritual fruit, supernatural effects of being saved. From current positional truth, we have the principle of the controlling ministry of the Holy Spirit through doctrine. The believer is saying, I know now that the control of the Holy Spirit produces a manifestation of divine fruit, divine characteristics, and God's own essence. If I fail, I will use 1 John 1, 9 and confess immediately. Baptism is the transition which indicates that you understand the issues of the past, that they're dead and they're buried. You understand it is a fact. Your sins have been paid for. Your sins are buried and so are you. You understand it, and that's why you get baptized. And, and it indicates that you understand how to appropriate and apply 
positional truth in the most practical, experiential way. Now, here are the seven baptisms, very quickly. Actual baptisms. Number one, the baptism of Moses. Now, remember, baptism means to identify, to be made one with. It means something to identify, so identified with something else that the nature and character is changed or represents a real change that has already taken place. Now, The baptism of Moses. Children of Israel identified with Moses and the cloud as they passed over the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. The second baptism. The baptism of the cross or the cup. Matthew 20, 22. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus Christ drank the cup filled with our sins, poured out by God his wrath. He drank the cup and he identified with our sins, bore it on the cross, and he was made sin for us. That is the baptism of the cup. And it's an amazing baptism when our precious Lord identified as the most wicked, vile sinner ever on the face of the universe because he just didn't have my sins. He had all of our sins. That made him the worst sinner ever on the universe, not because he did anything wrong ever, but he identified by a real, real, real baptism. He bore our sins in his own body, 1 Peter 2.24. He became sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. The next baptism, or the third baptism, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here's where some precious people that I love very much are way out there, and they never seem to come back except a few of them. The baptism of the Spirit is not speaking in tongues. It's not some great experience. It's not great amount of power coming into your life and all of a sudden you're different for the next five months. The baptism by the Spirit happens at the point of your salvation by God. It is not a feeling. It is not a feeling. It is a fact. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Acts 1, 5, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Galatians 3, Colossians 2.12, Ephesians 4.5. It is called the one baptism. Now, we are placed into the body of Christ. He is identified then as a believer, as a Christian, that very second. That's the baptism by the Spirit into one body. Believers... You must understand this is a real baptism based upon fact when you believe. Now, the fourth real baptism is the baptism of fire. Now, it's very difficult for me, and I say this lovingly, graciously, and honestly with humility and compassion, but it's very difficult for me to hear gifted men on television, as I did a week ago, preacher, preaching about the baptism with fire. The baptism with fire has nothing to do with tongues. If these people understood it, the tongues, people heard the gospel in their own native language. It had nothing to do with an unknown tongue. You look up the words unknown and see what unknown is as you study 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. See how much I... See how much, what does unknown mean? Check out your italics. Now, baptism by fire has nothing to do with Matthew 3.11. With all of a sudden, I'd say even a year later, I'm walking down the street like Moody in the screen. It may, sure, sure, I may have the, the power of God manifested to me. I may have an amazing, wonderful time when I apply truth that 
changes my life. I'm not, I'm not discrediting that. But that's not an experience to be sought for. That's the effect of faith at some point. Do you see that? It's the effect of something that's already happened by faith. It's not an experience to seek. It's something that finally happens when you understand and apply something. It's so simple. That has already happened to you. It's not going to happen. It has happened, and finally you understand it. Finally you believe it, and finally you apply it. Well, water uh, baptism by fire is the baptism of God's judgment at the second advent on all unbelievers in the battle of Armageddon. Let me give you the verses. Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, 33. Matthew 3, 11. Luke 3, 16. And 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Now, this is a very, very serious baptism. Baptism by fire. Now, what does it mean? Now, you think with me. If God's going to have to have a perfect environment in the millennial reign, don't you think this lot got to happen to make it perfect? So he, he takes all the unbelief, he takes all them away. Then he takes Satan and chains him. Okay, that takes care of the unbelievers. That takes care of the devil. Now he's got to do something to the environment. So he purges it and makes it perfect. So at the beginning of the millennial reign, the environment will be perfect as it starts out. And he does that through a supernatural, divine baptism of fire. These people that think God is going to use the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, to end everything. I want to tell you he is not. I'm not saying that won't happen in terms of some measures of destruction. But you know what's going to do it? The word. All God is going to do in Revelation 19, 13, and 14 is speak the word. He's not going to use man. He's, not going, to, he's going to bypass man. He's just going to say, judgment, and it'll all happen. He's not going to have any bow or arrow or guns or hydrogen bombs or anything else. So these, these great prophets that have written, oh, God is going to use Zechariah 12.10, and he's going to use the hydrogen bomb to bring a fire upon the universe. No, he is not. There's not one verse of Scripture that teaches that to a student. That's a man trying to get another week of offering from the crowd. Boy, they use it all, don't they? <laughs> Ritual baptisms. Representative identification. Water is used. Water is symbolic of something else, but the individual is really identified with the water. First we have, in the ritual baptism, the baptism of John, 3.6 of Matthew, 3.11a. Water there is, a symbolic, is symbolic of the kingdom of God which John preached. The people, when baptized by John, were indicating, in effect, I have previously believed in Christ. I'm now symbolizing that identification with his kingdom by baptism unto repentance. That's the baptism of John. Baptism of Jesus, the most unusual baptism in all the world. Water was used. Jesus Christ was not a sinner. Not a sinner. But when he went into the water... He identified with God's will. He was identifying with the Father's will with his baptism. He was saying, I am immersed under the Father's will through the Spirit in my humanity. Therefore, Jesus Christ is identified, or identified himself with the Father's will and the execute of salvation in identifying with our sins and our sin by going into that water. Now, that's Matthew three thirteen to 17. We cannot follow the Lord in baptism as to his purpose, securing our redemption, because we're not going to be baptized to get somebody redeemed. We're getting baptized to express what he did for us on the cross and the five things that happened at the moment of our belief. So we can't duplicate the mode of the Lord's baptism. But it is... Better to never use that phrase, follow the Lord, in baptism. 
That's very important not to use that phrase. Now we have the baptism of the believer in the church age. Water represents the person of Jesus Christ. The believers are identified with Christ in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. It symbolizes retroactive and current positional experiential truth. It is the ritual of real baptism of the Holy Spirit above. It is thus a picture of, of the Spirit's baptism. So, if there's one thing a believer must understand is this business of baptism before I teach to you Romans 6. So since my teaching Romans 6, unless I thoroughly establish the doctrine of baptism. Now, the cup of Jesus' baptism simply meant the Father judged those sins of the world, Isaiah 53, 4-6. He drank the cup, John 18, 11. God's wrath was upon him. And it also means in the passive voice he received judgment for sins. The active voice, he deliberately drank the cup. His volition was involved in his human response. So there it is. Now, if we can understand this, and I believe that you do, then people that get saved should be taught six or seven hours, and this is historically correct, and be baptized as quickly as possible. Now, it's an amazing thing to me how some people just never get baptized. Baptism doesn't save us, of course. It reveals we were saved, but it is a commandment. It's a mandate once after salvation. Now, the next time we are going into the following principles, knowing, yielding, no, I'm sorry, reckoning. Knowing, reckoning, yielding, obeying. Say it. Knowing, reckoning, yielding, obeying. These four things are part of the application in experiential truth that explains our retroactive position. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is this. If we understand the doctrine of baptism. Now imagine you go to India and the Church of Christ over there and everybody comes up to you and tells you they've been, you can't be saved until you're baptized. And somebody else comes and says, baptism isn't even necessary. You've got to know this doctrine. Inside, outside, upside, downside. And know it so that you personally can experience it. We must be able to experience the spiritual power and authority of the finished work, the spiritual availability of our derived life so that we can live without sin having government, dominion, authority over us. We live beyond the cross. We live beyond our failure. We live beyond our guilt. We live beyond what people have done to us. That is crucified and buried. We live and walk in Romans 6, 4 in the newness of life, in the spirit, not the letter, in Romans 7, 6. Because of this, we have a phenomenal, amazing life to be enjoyed, victory to be experienced, triumph to be, in, to be had. We are more, all Christians in the world are so fortunate. They don't ever have to deal with sin again. They don't ever have to deal with sins. They don't have to deal with people's flesh. They don't have to deal with their past failures once they've confessed them. They don't have to deal with what people have done to them. And they don't have to deal with what people are doing to them. They don't have to deal with the memory of Adam. They don't have to deal with any of these things. They are abs And that's what God means when he says, you're, you're, I'll always cause you to triumph. You just can triumph because you don't have to deal with all the nasty problems that everybody else has to deal with. And so you are extremely fortunate that you understand the true, present, current application of experiential union with Christ.
You never have to say and cry that my uncle did this. My uncle's 11 and I've been feeling unclean. I've been married eight years and I can't have sex with my... Uh, that is, I can't enjoy it because I was molested by a family member. You don't have to say that. Not at all. Because that just doesn't apply to you because of some facts that are yours and your feelings can go you know where and you're dismissed.